morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our distinguished speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences of the ZNS webinars. Today, we have arranged two great educative sessions for you, which are focused mainly on spine. The speaker for the first session of today is, is our honored guest and senior faculty from Pakistan, Professor Salman Sharif. Professor Sharif is the head of the Department of Neurosurgery, Liaquat Medical School, Karachi, Pakistan. He is the president of the World Spinal Column Society. He was a past vice president of the Pakistan Society of Neurosurgeons. He is an noted author and researcher who is a member of the editorial board of several journals. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to be a speaker at webinars. And today he'll be talking about management of traumatic cervical spine injuries. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from Taiwan, Professor Fon Yi Stuan. He is currently assistant professor of neurosurgery and director of spine oncology fellowship at the National Taiwan University, Taipei. He completed his AO spine tumor fellowship under the mentorship of Professor Stefano Boriani at Rizzoli, Italy. Dr. Suang has an active clinical practice center of spinal neurosurgery, especially spine oncology. His research interests have focused on spine biomechanics, biomaterials, and tissue injury. His research guided spine tumors was awarded by the AO spine East Asia in 2019. He was here and and blocks like me and allergies. The chair for the first session of today is Professor Paulo Pereira from Portugal. Professor Pereira is a consultant neurosurgeon, spine surgeon, faculty of medicine, University of Porto, Portugal. He is also an assistant professor in neurology and neurosurgery, faculty of medicine, University of Porto, Portugal. Professor Pereira has done several administrative positions in his country. He is currently the secretary general of the World Spinal Column Society. He was the past vice president as well as president of the Portuguese Neurosurgical Society and Portuguese Spine Society. We are extremely honored to have him today to chair the session of Professor Salman Sharif. The chair for the second session of today is Professor Yusuke Nishimura from Japan. Professor Nishimura is the Associate Professor in Department of Neurosurgery in Nagoya University, Japan. He is also the Chief of Director of Spine Program in Nagoya University. He was a previous fellow at the St. Michael's Hospital Division of Neurosurgery, University of Toronto under Professor Michael Fillings. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the second session of today's webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this platform to the first chair, Professor Paulo Pereira. Okay, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. And uh, first, I'd like to, to thank Dr. Raja and Professor Yoko Kato for the very kind invitation. It's a pleasure to join you today. And, uh, and we'll start with uh, Professor Sharif's presentation on uh, on, uh, on C-spine injuries, as you know, uh, there are a lot of uh, still remaining controversies regarding uh, time of surgery, need for uh, MRI, in, uh, in some injuries such as uh, spine dislocation, as the best manage management of some injuries, particularly odontoid fractures and especially in the elderly. Uh, so. Um, Hopefully, we will cover some of these um, uh, of these topics, and we'll bring some light to to these issues. So, Professor Salman Sharif, please. Thank you, Paolo. It's really an honor um, to be introduced by Paolo, who's a dear friend for years. Uh, we've worked together in various uh, places and enjoyed some amazing workshops and meetings all over the world. I thank um, Raja, as always, and our dear friends from ACNS for inviting me to uh, deliver this lecture. Um, as we all know that um, cervical trauma itself is a big problem in our part of the world. Um, in the lower middle income countries and in third world countries, the problem is very grave and we have not addressed it properly. And the problem for that has been manifold. We know that the annual incidence of spinal cord injury is 15 to 40 cases per million uh, people. And you know, majority of this 40s and 30s lie in Africa or Asia. In the United States, the prevalence exceeds 1 million with an incidence of 40 cases per million per person annually. Um, well, who are the people who are at risk? That's what we need to know. Um, people who sustain polytrauma, who are unconscious, who are minor trauma with neck pain or numbness in their hands. So what are the factors that lead to delaying the diagnosis? Obviously, you've got concurrent head injury. You've got altered state of consciousness, poor radiology and multiple injuries. And we have seen that in all our institutions, all these scenarios at some stage, and we must address this. Uh, we know the pathophysiology, lots have been talked about, about primary and secondary injury. And obviously our goal is to make sure that the process which follows primary injury 
microcirculation disruption, autoregulation, edema, and ischemia. We need to go and avoid that and take out the pressure, whatever there is, as soon as possible, if, if it's possible. Um, the initial management, obviously, evaluation, resuscitation, immobilization, and you extract that patient and transport. I'm not going to go into that in detail. All I'm going to say is, obviously, hard cervical collar, hard cervical board, straps are essential uh, for any person to be transferred. If somebody has had an injury and neck is, neck is not in neutral position, an attempt should be made in order to achieve alignment, if at all possible. If you think that you're having a lot of resistance, then you need to stop. If you know that the neurology is uh, getting worse, you need to stop. So in, you can do that in an awake patient as well. The spine board should be removed as soon as possible, as soon as the patient is in um, uh, the ER. Uh, the prolonged use of bed, even for more than two to three hours, have shown to um, give rise to uh, bed sores uh, five days to say, seven days down the road. So fill, full immobilization should be maintained and obviously log rolls should be um, a regular feature. Um, so the hospital management also includes the management of neurogenic shock, spinal shock, autonomic dysreflexia, and pharmacological therapy. And I'll uh, touch some of these one by one um, briefly. A log roll is essential and you know there must be a fixed way of doing it and not one person trying to do it ideally four people but minimum of three people should be turning the patient and it's essential and all workers in er should be aware of that it can you can clear any c spine clinically if patient is alert oriented no head injury no drug or alcohol no pain um, no neurology no significant other distraction injury and the famous canadian c spine rule three questions uh, age more than 65 dangerous mechanism, paresthesia and extremities. So if you don't have all these, you know, you don't need to do an x-ray. You ask the patient to flex, extend their neck, and if they can do it and have no, they have no pain, there is no tenderness. You don't need to do any radiology there. You have excluded a problem. Um, how about evaluation of a patient? Obviously, general um, observation, if you have got somebody with an abrasion on the forehead or a laceration there, that something has hit there, then you can be thinking more in line of that he's got some kind of flexion injury and leading to another extension injury and obviously um, giving rise to problems in that area. So you'll be thinking about upper cervical spine fractures as well. You palpate for localization of pain, you do a neurology examination, and all these are very, very important and I'll touch them briefly. Um, besides ABC of resuscitation obviously needs to be, needs to come into play straight away. Imaging studies, uh, we've stopped doing C-spine x-rays except when a scenario when we don't have a CT scan for whatever reason then you can do a, a plain x-ray to start with, but you know we don't do that anymore. If you do plain x-ray, obviously you need to be looking at all these lines before you decide that patient uh, is cleared. Uh, obviously uh, also you need to make sure the patient is non-tender. You should be able to see all the way down to C7, D1 junction. You should not be stopping here, otherwise you cannot rule it out and patient should have a collar until you've got a clear cut x-ray. Obviously you can do an odontoid as well, other images as well. Um, but other images have to be done under supervision. Well, what are the indications we have already talked about? Craniofacial injury also comes into play here and somebody with polytrauma, obviously you need to investigate. We know that we will miss 33% of the, one third of these injuries would be missed if um, uh, we just rely on a C-spine X-ray. So we need to have something else to make sure that doesn't happen. And this can have devastating long-term consequences. So CT scan is now recommended. Guidelines um, of all the big societies say that you should have an adequate quality multi-slice CT scanner with the sagittal reconstruction and plain x-rays are inadequate. MRI, I'm going to talk about in detail later on when we talk about what's new in MRI and why we should do MRI in our patients. So um, the guidelines, uh, uh, which were way back in 2004, were clear that patients with a normal X-ray and fine slice CT have a 98% chance of no significant spinal injury, particularly unstable or subluxation. And we know that MRI does not give you 100% clearance, and um, there is a very low chance of potential instability if your plain X-ray, CT, or MRI are clear. We know this. So this is common sense. Um, there are some patients who would require um, uh, traction straight away, and there are some patients in whom that it is contraindicated, and we should know this. So injuries that can be treated on traction, displaced Jeff Jefferson fracture, 
Hangman's fracture, type 2 and type 3 odontoid back fractures, displaced subaxial fractures, and subaxial subluxation and dislocation. So the important thing is that we need to be wary that Hangman's type 2A fracture, if you put the traction, you can have a risk of spinal cord injury and subsequent death. So you should be wary of that if you put in uh, tongs on somebody. Physiological effect, loss of sympathetic tone, bradycardia, hypotension, and decreased respiratory um, efforts are all, will all play a role in these patients. Obviously, complete and incomplete injuries um, are basic classification. And then there are different syndromes, and I will briefly touch them later on. Um, flexion, rotation injury, first of all. So if you've got a rotation, you're going to have a unilateral uh, dislocation, as you can see here. So you've got a bit of subluxation coming through and you've got unilateral dislocation. And obviously, if you have the same thing in the upper C spine, you can have an atlanto axial dislocation as well, which is rotary. Extension injuries, you can have hangman fracture, you, you can have extension teardrop fracture, you can have posterior atlanto axial dislocation. So anything that obviously when your neck goes back and it causes uh, compression, then those two vertebras come together and cause problems. So you could have a fracture of the posterior arch of C1 as well. Vertical compression, if the compression is from the top, then you can get a Jefferson fracture with burst fracture of uh, C1. You could have a dispersion. You could have an atlas fracture or isolated fracture of the lateral mass of C1, which is just a pillar going on one side. So then there are complex fractures in, in which there is odontoid, C2, atlanta, occipital, and occipital condyle fractures. I'm not going to go into detail of upper cervical spine fractures, in a, and I'm going to stick to um, subaxial cervical spine. Pediatric spinal cord injury, it's difficult to immobilize a patient adequately. Some people do not, do not have adequate size collars, although there are all sides of collars now available. If you don't have them, then you can use blocks, tapes, um, and manual inline stabilization is essential. Um, and obviously these scans need to be discussed with the radiologist besides us seeing this patient because many of them look like normal and they may have an abnormality in it. And so pediatric cervical spinal cord injuries have to be uh, very carefully dealt with. Neurogenic shock and the uh, mean arterial pressure. I think it's very important that since 1980s, in fact, since 1970s, our friends who were doing neurosurgery at that time realized that this is important. And they started doing this. So papers started coming out late 70s and 80s. And they clearly showed that if you uh, bring the mean arterial pressure above 85 or greater for first seven days after injury, it, it demonstrates favorable outcomes. So 25% of these patients experience a component of neurogenic shock who develop a cervical cord injury. And they have a systemic vascular resistance. So all these uh, can run into play. So dopamine or epinephrine and epinephrine are first line medicines. Obviously anybody who's above the age of 60 or have other comorbids, you need to be thinking more in line of norepinephrine or uh, epinephrine instead of dopamine because of uh, significant side effects. But now this is a norm and it's essential if a patient comes to you who's got spinal cord injury. Um, so in our uh, department, ob obviously everybody gets a CT, everybody gets an MRI because we can get it straight away. On top of it, everybody uh, gets uh, hypertense and we make sure that their mean arterial pressure is above 85. And we have shown a clear difference in outcome compared to what we used to have 15 years ago. Um, so sorry, I'm not supposed to show this to you first. I was going to show you a nice picture in the background. I don't know why, for whatever reason, uh, the Zoom does not show the background picture and shows Mehmet and um, um, our friend Greg and Greg is, as always, trying to uh, attack somebody. So uh, this is what I wanted to show, that Vicaro, back in 2007, came up uh, along with the spine trauma study group with the um, subaxial cervical spine injury classification. And the classification consisted of morphology, discoligamentous complex, and neurological status. And they were able to predict on those bases which patients may require um, surgery and which patients no not. And they were able to differentiate among the two. So, and, um, so what they basically did was that uh, they divided the fractures into compression, the burst, the distraction, and translation rotation, and gave them scoring accordingly. And then this collegiumentous complex, if it was involved, if it was uh, indetermined and uh, wasn't involved, so they gave scoring according to that and neurology. And what they did was they gave a score of uh, zero. If you were intact, root injury, you got one. 
if you had complete injury, you got two, incomplete injury, three, because they wanted you to have a bigger score to do these uh, cases who had incomplete injury as soon as possible. But they gave another score uh, for somebody with persistent cord compression. So we know now that um, we give equal importance to complete and incomplete spinal cord injury because we know that the outcome in these patients uh, with complete injury, um, one fourth or one fifth of these patients can walk again if you do all uh, what's required with you. And we have talked about uh, early surgery, um, uh, pharmacological therapy, along with um, uh, maintaining the blood pressure up with various uh, medicines. So we were able to predict with the help of this that um, we have uh, level one evidence with s and C CS CSISS, which includes dividing them into quadrants. Um, and it was a really, really reliable overall internal consistency indicated by worsening of score reflect worse injury. So we knew that as the score got worse, the injury was worse as well. And the outcome depending on that was worse. So that's why you would operate it on these people early if required. And then came in AO classification. And, um, and I know there's a lot of work put in by the AO group in this. And uh, slowly and gradually, they've improved it a lot and brought to a level where it can be used quite easily. It's still cumbersome. There's a lot of factors involved here. But as a neurosurgeon, it's, it's easier for us to sort these out. So if you've got compression fracture, you've got a, a type A, A0, A1, A2, A3, and A4, depending on the severity of the burst fracture. Then you have tension band injuries in which bony involvement, ligament is bony involvement, and anterior tension band involvement. And then you had bilateral, if they had bilateral injury. For translation injury, they went on to C. And for facet injuries, they divided that into F1, S, F2, F3, and F4. And it was just very, very simple formulas. So initially, it used to look, uh, look really cumbersome and difficult. Um, but recently, they made it slightly more cumbersome, but made it easier because they brought in what it didn't have beforehand, the neurology and the modifiers. And by bringing in neurology, uh, they brought their classification at nearly to the same level as the SLICs, but they had more detailed um, uh, explanation of all, each and every factor. And that's why now we routinely use both of these classification in our uh, setup and able to predict beforehand which patients will require early surgery and what kind of outcome they're gonna have with the help of that. The, well, the thing with modifiers, what they did was they also included posterior ligamentous complex along with that, if there was a cervical disc or not, M2, and then uh, any metabolic disease or stiffening and then a vertebral um, artery injury. And depending on that, they gave scores and realized that yes, we were able to predict uh, these patients which, who may require surgery. And many people have done studies looking at the outcome comparing these uh, um, all these uh, studies and realize that, you know, both of them are equally good at the moment, but AO is still a little cumbersome. So radiographic assessment. So these are level, uh, level one gui uh, guidelines in which from this is CNS and AANS. So asymptomatic patient, as we talked about, do not require any um, uh, uh, radiology as long as they have no neck pain, no tenderness, no neurology, and they are awake and normal functioning, and we can discontinue cervical immobilization in such patients. What about in awake symptomatic patient with high quality CT scan is recommended. If high quality CT is available, routine 3D uh, X-rays are not recommended. If high quality CT is not available, then you get those X-rays um, until we have uh, CT scan available. So I think it's important that if at all possible, you should get a CT. Radiology in an obtended patient, obviously every patient who's um, uh, we can't evaluate or is obtended, high quality CT imaging is required uh, as the initial imaging modality of the choice. If CT imaging is unavailable, again, you do the same, you do an X-ray, but you'd like to do the CT as soon as possible. What about methylprednisolone? Well, this study uh, um, clearly um, by Brecken series of studies showed that methylprednisone, which is an anti-inflammatory agent given within eight hours of administration, uh, they showed that uh, there was some benefit according to them. Although their third study, it failed to show an effect in comparison to placebo. Uh, in fact, it, uh, additionally, it causes uh, more infections and its use is no longer recommended. This was back in 1984. So this study in 2000 and uh, uh, looking at the critical appraisal of the reporting of NASCAS trials, and they said that reporting of the results of NASCAS studies two and three 
have been incomplete, leaving clinicians in the spinal cord injury community to use or avoid using methylprednisolone in acute spinal cord injury on the basis of faith, rather than publicly developed scientific consensus. So this is the summary of what's happened with the Brecken trials and where we are at the moment. So the guidelines now are very clear. The administration of methylprednisolone for treatment of acute, acute spinal cord injury is not recommended. It is not approved by the FDA. There is no class one or class two medical evidence. There is class one, class two, and three evidence exist that high dose steroids are associated with harmful side effects, including death. So routinely now we do not use steroids. There are only a very small portion of patients where steroids are used. And uh, I'm sure we can talk about that in discussion. Um, acute central cord syndrome, most commonly involved um, uh, incomplete cord injury, cervical trauma with incomplete injury, loss of motor and sensory in upper extremities out of proportion to lower extremities. Older patients with pre-existing cervical spondylosis, and these are hyperextension injuries, referential da uh, damages to the anterior medial uh, spinal cord, so anterior horn cells, anterior white commissure, loss of motor and sensory function in the upper limbs. Um, Chen et al. demonstrated improved recovery after surgical decompression in young patients, long-term improvement neurological outcome versus conservative treatment, especially if focal site of compression. Timing, timing of surgery is controversial. There's lack of benefit in early decompression. Recommendation, early decompression for younger patients or significant neurological dysfunction, secondary to focal decompression, you should be thinking about early surgery. Recovery is fair to poor, but in recent studies, if you have hypertensed them, uh, if you had taken care of those patients, then obviously your um, outcome is gonna be slightly different than what you used to have in the past. What about incomplete cord syndromes? So anterior cord syndrome, damage to the anterior third, a variable recovery, posterior cord syndrome, least common, loss of vibration and uh, position sense, recovery is fair. Whereas with brown C cord, it is very uncommon, injured to half of the cord, so some kind of a knife injury or something like that. So you've got ipsilateral motor weakness and loss of, pro loss of proprioception. You've got excellent prognosis in these patients. So what is the indication for emergent surgery? Progressive neurology with uh, irreducible canal compromise should be the one that you should be doing as soon as possible. Regarding the timing of surgery, there have been multiple trials over uh, the years. Um, so this is the famous TASCAS trial in which Michael Feeling um, performed a, uh, this trial between 2002 and 2009, so in the, you know, a decade before. And what they did was they uh, looked at the emerging evidence and consensus among spine surgeons for early decompression with the first 24 hours of injury. At six months post-injury, Early, early cervical decompression was associated with 2.4-fold increased odds of a two-grade Asia impairment scale improvement with no difference in acute uh, complications. So we looked at this uh, again, and we showed nearly the same kind of scenario. 23% of our patients who were in early um, improved, uh, whereas only 8.7% in the late group to at least two Asia, grade, um, Asia impairment grade. So early surgical intervention, there is evidence that surgical decompression and stabilization within six hours of a partial spinal cord injury will lead to 70% of patients improving by one or more Asia grades. If the surgery is delayed beyond six hours, there is only a 12% chance. So you can see the difference between 70% versus 12%. And I think we should be lining these patients uh, more in that line that as soon as possible, these patients with compression um, should be dealt with. So evaluation of SLIX in the treatment of subaxial spinal cord injury. So um, it depends on the uh, preference of the surgeon, SLIX guided treatment. And this study obviously was biased with the, uh, because of the bias of the surgeon, but it showed SLIX system provide good to excellent interreliability, but SLIX validity was poor. It may be best applied in the education setting to confirm fracture morphology in presence or absence of ligament injury between surgeons and radiologists. Um, what about another study showing that there's a high agreement in SLIX and the treatment chosen more than 90% agreement between them. And they demonstrated that SLIX was uh, safe and effective. Uh, what about fracture dislocation? 
So the 421 patients in this study were recruited, were in, enrolled into uh, 135, is a 30% of them with facet dislocation and 70% with no facet dislocation. They compared with patients without fracture dislocation, spinal cord injury patients with dislocation tend to present with a more severe degree of initial injury and displayed less potential for motor recovery at one year follow-up. So initial reduction, can we do it? Close reduction initially. Historically, it was close reduction always. Quick alignment restoration, reduced potential injuries, promote recovery, 80% success rate. What about neurological deterioration? If you close, do a close reduction, um, will that cause that? So there are multiple studies over that. So displaced disc material could be causing compression. Predictive value of MRI for deterioration following close reduction is controversial. Permanent neurological deficits in patients who had close reduction are less than 1% transient from 2 to 4%. But if you have an awake patient, uh, uh, then reduction performed with monitoring, not recommended to obtain pre-reduction MRI if patient is awake, we, we can tell you. With obtended patient, obviously you need to be thinking about doing a pre-reduction MRI, if at all possible. If you can't do that, you need to take the patient to theater and do this as soon as possible. Um, it, obviously, these are high injury um, uh, uh, kind of things in which we have high rate of neurological injury. These are unstable spine. It's a combination of flexion and extension injuries, significant translational deformity across bony injury. So anytime you've got a patient like this, you need to be thinking about, can I put a traction? Because if you put a traction, you will open up the canal straight away. So if you put a traction, about 40% of the canal opens up straight away, depending on what level you, are, you have the injury. And because of that, uh, you can cause improvement straight away. So that is essential. And some of these patients, you may be able to, be able to reduce. Uh, so these are due to severe hyperflexion injuries. And you can, you can see them coming out. Uh, so it causes disruption of ligamentous complex. Um, so less than 25% of bony um, subluxation if it's unilateral. If it's bilateral, it's got more than 50% of subluxation. Uh, and you've got neurological injuries more severe, and these are high in, um, injury uh, mechanisms. So you've got mild unilateral facet dislocation. It's more often stable. If you have no neurology, patient is um, unfit for surgery, you can even consider uh, external orthosis. With bilateral facet dislocation, it's unstable, and you need to have uh, surgical stabilization as soon as possible. Do you need to do a pre-reduction MRI? We have already talked about it. Uh, if at all possible, you should get it. Uh, rule out traumatic herniated disc. It's not, not necessary in patients that can be examined serially. Some recommend ACDF if traumatic disc is present. Advantages and disadvantages we're going to talk about later. So with anterior approach, fracture dislocation with disc herniation. That's after discectomy, laminal spreader, gas power pins can distract. Posterior approach, irreducible injuries that you have to drill the joint out to open it up and then uh, uh, relocate it. Combined approach in some of these cases where you've got bilateral and you cannot reduce it. If, uh, and this is very, very rare. So strategies for reduction. We talked about it, close reduction is possible. Only the risk of retropulse fragment would be there, which would be less than 1% chance of a, a serious injury or neurological deterioration. Um, so open reduction. Posterior, dangerous in the presence of a disc, as we talked about, it, it can be done with three level fixation for one motion segment. So two vertebra instability, it's necessary to excise the facets, uh, also require three level, uh, three vertebral fixation. Whereas with anterior approach, you can have just a single uh, segment ortho orthodesis, a lower infection rate, higher radiology uh, union rates, better lordotic alignments so that you can put in a bigger cage and, and at the same time, use bigger screws uh, to make sure that things uh, do not disrupt afterwards. So you don't have to do 360 degree. Obviously, when you go and come in anteriorly, 2% of these patients can have voice changes and 5% can have dysphagia, which is generally transient. So uh, close reduction, successful in 90 to 60 to 90% of acid dis uh, dislocation. Incidence of uh, extruded fragment is very low. We have talked about, we have talked about this MRI and why and why you should do it, why you should not do it before. What about um, and, uh, reduction? You can have a simple reduction just by um, obstruction to the reduce, already removed. So you use, use the disc, disc, you use the annulus, and it uh, automatically sits back if you've got a little bit of traction there. 
And uh, interbody spreader technique is very simple. You, you may use a Cloward interbody retractor, 30 to 40 degree angle into the disk space. And it allows uh, creation of bending moment. So you rotate it. And once you rotate it, it goes back, slides in, as long as the patient is completely relaxed. But the important thing is to remember, you need to have this in slight traction because you don't want to be causing the cord to suddenly jump back. Um, so if it's a bilateral facet dislocation, spreader is placed in the mid vertebral body. If it's on the side, you place it uh, on the side of dislocation and just spread it to open it up. And torque is applied on the long axis of the spine. Um, and then you should be able to reduce it. The other mechanism, if, if, it's, if you use um, the uh, Casper pins, and then you bring them at an angle and you uh, distract them. Once you've distracted them, you can push yourself or you can rotate it to ensure that the facet uh, rotates along with that. In the unilateral facet dislocation, only you need is a side width of rotation and you should be able to correct in majority of these cases. What about prognosis and radiology? Can we predict on radiology what's going to happen? Yes, we can do that if we have an MRI and it can play a crucial role in evaluating and detecting early trauma as well. But nowadays we only do MRI once uh, we are happy we can do it very, very quickly. So it, it can give you subtle bone marrow, soft tissue, bone, spinal cord abnormalities and early detection often leads to prompt and accurate diagnosis and management. Uh, so why would radiological classification help? Obviously, you can predict functional outcome, better understanding of the neurological impairment, and assessment of neurological injury in children who, who we can't evaluate properly. So uh, this study um, uh, basically showed that if you had patients with presence of sizable focus of hemorrhage more than one centimeter in the cord and had large um, cord edema and more severe grade of Asia impairment scale and had poor recovery. So this basic score was put forward by uh, Jason Talbot, and uh, he basically retrospectively looked at 131 patients who had principal diagnosis of spinal cord injury, and then they gave them a score from zero to four. So basically score zero had no appreciable intramedullary spinal cord injury, so it was clear. Um, the grade two had intramedullary T2 hyperintensity, as you can see here, just like here, and so it's only residing inside the central gray matter. And once it's going beyond gray matter, involving the white matter, they, they give a score of two. And if it, if it was involving um, the whole of the spinal cord, they gave a score of um, three. And if it had hemorrhages in them, then it gave a score of um, a four. And what they showed was that patients who had um, no, um, nothing on their MRI, no uh, kind of um, contusion, in that particular case, the majority of these patients were in E and some D, and all of them converted to E except one. Basic score one, uh, majority of them were C, D, and E, and majority improved to E and some to D. Basic score two had patients in A, B, and C, and all these patients improved to B, C, and D. So none of these patients remained in A, so we know that they will improve. The patients who had whole of the cord involved um, half of them improved and about 40% uh, of them did not. On the other hand, where if they had micro hemorrhages in there, these patients did not improve, none of them. So we can, uh, it's an excellent prognosticating factor. Uh, preliminary data suggests that basic score will help distinguish patients who present with Asia A and improve before discharge of, uh, against somebody who's not going to uh, recover. So they propose that this should be applied and should be used more often. Um, what about a multivariate analysis of MRI biomarkers for predicting neurological injury? <clears throat> and this was uh, done recently, and they had an MRI, uh, especially looking at axial grade, so basic score, sagittal grade, length of injury, maximum canal compromise, and maximum spinal cord compression. So they looked at sagittal length, uh, maximum spinal cord compression, and canal compromise, basic score, and how many levels um, the, the sagittal involvement of the cord was. And they showed that they were able to predict neurological impairment in acute spinal cord injury and prognosis accordingly. But their main focus was again on basic score that had, gave the maximum uh, prediction for prognosis in these patients. Nowadays, recently, DTI has come on its own and uh, lots of people are using uh, um, diffusion um, coefficient along with axial diffusivity and have shown that this you may be able to predict the outcome. What do we know so far for DTI? 
So majority of the studies so far are animal studies, two clinical studies, total of 39 studies in human until six months ago. Only a couple of these studies uh, with one year uh, long-term follow-up. And basically the DTI parameters reflect the severity of spinal cord injury and correlates well with Asia motor score in patients with non-hemorrhagic uh, spinal cord injury. And this is how DTR presents with, depending on each level. Recently, functional MRI uh, role has also been uh, looked at and be able to map the spinal function, motor and sensory area into it, especially using the bold sequence, which is blood oxygen level dependent. Uh, we use that as a contrast and a, a signal enhancement from extracellular water proton caused by increase in water content in that area. So predictive radiology, as, you, as I said, you can do this with the help of uh, CT, facet dislocation will give you that prediction. MRI T2 can give you that prediction. Basic score can give you that prediction. And DTI recently, uh, we were able to predict about the, about the prognosis in these patients. So what about soft tissue injuries? Um, uh, these are hyperextension and hyperflexion injuries. And these are because of the excessive stretch on the torn muscles and they heal with time and cause scar and can have uh, pain for a long time, especially if somebody has got some monetary things associated with it. I'm not gonna go into that. Uh, briefly about Skivora, it was originally described in pediatric population before MRI. It's more common in children. So basically spinal cord injury without radiological evidence of trauma and associated with pre-existing canal compromise with OPLL, ankylosing spondylitis, disc herniation, and spinal stenosis. So Skevora, obviously what you do is you do assessment with CT, MRI, and dynamic X-ray, and you're able to predict, uh, see all that, which is supposed to be Skevora to have a contusion in the cord, a signal change, and all this can be predicted uh, with the help of these images. So there are no more, uh, very rarely we see scavoras now. What about burst compression factor? Presentation could be neck pain, radiculopathy, or cord injury. So it depends on neurology and instability. So we use uh, S-Lakes or AO um, classification and depending on that we decide we're going to operate or not. So if it's stable, obviously all you need is a collar. So depending on how much of compression there is, if it's an unstable with vertebral body height loss of more than 40 or kyphosis is more than 20, the chronic neck pain, uh, you can think about surgery in these patients. Uh, what about burst fracture with incomplete cord injury? Again, I think the same rules applies as we have talked about uh, before. Um, we came out with recommendation for um, uh, uh, spinal cord injury with World Federation of Neurological Surgeons Spine Committee. And the recommendations are pretty simple. So s um, and it's basically a summary of what I've just talked about. It's safe and effective in guiding treatment of uh, subaxial cervical spine injury. There is a good agreement rate, more than 90% in the s score, morphology, neurology, and discolimigament is complex, and the treatment chosen. In order to be precise for classification, they suggest that they use MRI, so especially looking at discoligament is complex because they could not see that just on the uh, CT and many patients were missed and we were guessing that is this injury or not and that's why if at all possible MRI is recommended. As we talked about modified AO with all the modifiers is now equally effective uh, though still a little complicated but I think as we are doing more and more studies regarding that I think slowly and gradually it's going to come up and will be as effective as other classifications. Uh, recommendation for close reduction of cervical spine fractures, there is no evidence that close reduction of cervical lock facets have more benefits to open reduction. So if a close reduction is attempted, awake patients with incomplete injuries are better candidate. If a reduction in patients with decreased consciousness is attempted, pre-reduction MRI and open reduction should be a preferred option. If a close reduction attempt fails, immediate anterior decompression and surgical reduction are better options. Best time for close reduction is not well known, although most papers suggest it should be as soon as possible. All patients after close reduction should be operated for stabilization and fusion. So you don't reduce and just leave them alone. You have to fuse them because they may have other injuries and you could cause serious problems in the long run and you have myelomalacia later on. In the management of log facet, if a posterior approach is considered, preoperative MRI is recommended. Traction helps in immobilizing the unstable segment and may help for traction or for reduction. In majority of acute, less than three days, lock facet anterior surgical techniques is sufficient. 
in chronic lock facet, more than two weeks, lower cervical lock facets with no uh, insignificant disc prolapse in conditions where anterior approach is not feasible, a posterior approach may be indicated. So I thank you all for listening to me. I apologize for taking this long. So hopefully we can discuss further uh, with our moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salman. That, that was not uh, so long at all, but it, it was a very comprehensive and extensive review. It's, it's really difficult to cover uh, such, a, such a broad uh, topic uh, with a, little, uh, a lot of controversies in, a, in such, a, uh, such a short time, but I, I think it was, it was really very, very helpful. Um, I don't know if there are uh, any comments from the, the participants or questions. That, okay. uh, I ask one question. Salman, I am Dr. Suresh Nair. Nice to see you. Pleasure, as always. Good to see you. Uh, Salman, just a couple of things. Uh, a great overview of uh, subaxial spine injury. Even though spine is not my cup of tea, I wanted to listen to your talk. That is why I thought I will stay here for the whole today's session. You talk very nicely about that static trial and the indication is if properly done, it should be done within six hours so that 70% improvement will be there. You told very clearly indications for MRI to see especially disc prolapse is there or also disco ligamentous injury, lock facet. These things one should get a MR. More importantly, focal hemorrhage and also edema, which can be poor prognosticators also. You told very nicely about axial grading score, basic score, but my two questions to you. Say in one of your initial slide, you showed about, you showed neurogenic shock and spinal shock. I am a little confused. Both, as far as I know, both are safe, or is it different? And second thing is, uh, Skivora, you correctly told, do you advise medial prednisolone for those patients? Two questions. Okay, so the, uh, you're very right. I think spinal uh, injury and uh, uh, neurogenic, uh, spinal shock and neurogenic shock are one and the same thing. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's basically a sequelae of the same thing. So yes, you're very correct. Regarding uh, Skivora, uh, the treatment is controversial. Um, and uh, since uh, we have had um, uh, all those uh, bad mouthing about the steroids, no, steroids are not routinely recommended. So pediatric neurosurgeons generally do not routinely recommend steroids for skevorum. So if you, have, if you can't find anything, just like rheumat uh, neurologists, when we can't find anything, sometimes we use steroids. So, uh, so we talked about that in some, there are some clear indications of steroids. For example, you have to operate on somebody and you don't have maybe a drill or a theater is unavailable and you can't operate till next day or there is a problem with that patient that we can't correct their problems before and a medical problem, whatever. So if you're going to be delaying an operation for a day or so, that is the time you can use steroids because now the compression is still there. You put the traction, you hypertense that patient and you wait until you can do that. And if that you may buy time by giving steroids. And you know you explain that to the family and as long as they understand there are significant risk involved, but as long as they know. Second thing is steroids is used when you've, when you've got a C7 T1 injury. And if you think that your uh, T1 is gone and you can't use your fingers, uh, we know that if, by giving steroids, there is a chance that you may improve, although the third trial did not show that. But that hunch in young people in whom we don't have a tummy issue, we don't have an, a chest issue. In young people, I use it sometimes when they have got C7, T1 injury to ensure that if he can get that hand back as soon as possible. Having said that, I use Rylazol in my patients as well sometimes. I use um, Haldi and um, so cur curcumin and um, milk in my patients routinely. And I've seen that there is a, you know, a, a suggestion that these patients, so although I, the trials have shown a hint towards improvement, but have not shown a clear cut benefit, but it's just that hunch that, you know, you're waiting for something. So obviously you can't help that patient in that 24 hours or whatever time delay there is. Um, so that's at the only time you'd use in young patients who, in whom you don't have any other um, comorbidities associated with it. Tell me one more question. So which are the cases where you tell you refuse surgery saying that, Poor prognosis, I, this is not a candidate for surgery. 
obviously, if you have got somebody who um, in whom the spinal cord is completely normal, so that's one. And no, then, no, no, abnormal. Yeah. Okay. So and uh, if nowadays, what we do is since we have the basic score and we are all our patients, we look at this basic score before we talk to the family, and you know because MRI is very convenient for us to do, um, uh, so we can easily get them straight away. Uh, because of that, all our patients get MRI and all our patients, we, we look at the score and we tell them that this is a prognosis we are looking at. So if somebody has got persistent compression, I would still operate with even if they are uh, grade four, telling them that the chance of improvement is negligible according to the score. But score is just a score of a retrospective series of 139 patients. So you never know. On top of it, uh, maybe when it was done at that time, they did not give um, uh, methyl pet to these patients. Maybe they did not hypertense them. Maybe they didn't have the traction. Maybe they did not have rehab or nursing as good as somebody else can have. So I think you need to give them the chance, whichever possible. If it's a young patient, definitely. If it's an old patient, still. I think nowadays our perception is for, our, for my residents and trainees, my most important thing is a complete spinal cord injury should give get as much as attention as incomplete injury. Because we know that you know one fifth of these patients can walk again. They may not walk normally, but they will walk. We know this. So we can bring them to that level. On top of it, now we have seen with the new advents that you know, there are people with the help of uh, these robots um, um, and robotic suits, uh, people have improved spinal cord, uh, people have made peop um, uh, these uh, injured patients walk even after five to six years of injury uh, using um, uh, different kind of stimulation, uh, even brain, as well as using uh, uh, a, a spinal cord in, in stimulation. And uh, having done that, they have shown improvement. On top of it, there are people who did a lot of it, but did not. So obviously those people are doing something right. So for example, um, people in Duke uh, are able to make people walk and they have had three patients who have walked and they've published that. Again, from Switzerland, from Lausanne, they have got um, out of these four, three patients, all three walk, walking and six to seven years post injury. So they're able to do that with the help of um, uh, spinal cord stimulation and this. And some people have even shown putting a chip. So, you have, so with the help of Wi-Fi, they're able to transfer the signals from the top to below. So despite there were no signals going through, the signals are still there distally, and you're able to pick them up. So there are lots of things which are coming up this spinal cord. And so I think in the next five, 10 years, you will see a difference. I think stem cell, unfortunately, did not uh, was not a very good cherry for us. We did try a lot, but uh, still we are not sh unsure about it. Okay, thanks, Alma. So, uh, spinal cord transection, a surgeon has a big role. Okay, that's what uh, your conclusion. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Salman. Thank you, Salman. And, and, um, and I, I agree with you that uh, there are a lot of things happening. Probably most of the things will come from, from this uh, um, biomechanical engineering. Uh, trying to restore some function. I think we are closer to that than to finding uh, really some uh, reattachment of, or, or growing of neurons. But also I think that the other trend, as you pointed out, the, that, uh, that likely most of the drugs we are giving is more a question of faith than, than real evidence. So if you give a steroid or real soul or some botanic infusion or whatever, um, it's, I, I would say it's unlikely that they will, they will make a lot of difference. But on the other side, as we saw in, the, in, the, in traumatic brain injury, um, there are more and more, uh, more, and more research uh, on uh, uh, intensive care uh, of, the, of those patients, like uh, spinal cord perfusion monitoring and, uh, and, and other kinds of things. What, what's your view about about this intensive yes. care management. There, there, there have been three um, studies up till now on uh, monitoring of the um, uh, pressure in the spinal cord and seeing that, you know, by changing different things can you improve. Also looking at different enzymes in that. Also looking at um, proteins in that. So, and so they're looking at various and also looking at interleukins in that. And they're able to um, um, suggest that if by doing that, they were able to... Um, uh, decide accordingly which patients they would operate or which patients they will not operate uh, kind of thing as well. But um, 
did they have any improvement out of it? I don't know. The, the problem is very few a number of like, um, you're talking about eight, 10 patients and not uh, big series. In animal models, they were able to do that, but in humans, they're unable to do any, any dif significant difference at all. Yeah, same for 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 stem cell. They they work in animals, but uh, but the, the bigger the animals, the more <laughs> difficult it gets to 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 improve function. I agree. You also mentioned you also mentioned about about MRI, and um, well, at least for me, uh, this this the basic score is at least in my hand is very difficult to to classify to know where is the 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 edema is coming just on the on the uh, on, on just uh, on, on the white uh, or, or on, on the gray matter or or whatever, yeah, I think it's it's di very difficult to 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 classify and and I think the role of of newer uh, MR modalities, as you as you pointed out, is um, is still is still is still unclear. Uh, do you use them routinely or? I think what has happened is initially, obviously, uh, even my SR didn't know. And so we, have to, we had to go through them and see multiple scans. So we sat down with 15, 20 scans and say, asked them what did they think. So all of them were coming up with different ideas. But once we went through, showed them the anatomy, enlarged it, and said, OK, this is how we're going to classify it. Now our junior most intern classifies it. Even the, all, you know, you're talking about all the, everybody in my department. So we have 20 people, and all of them know basic score very well. Our radiologists now also score them at the same time they see. So the a scan gets done, they dictate it straight away, and they get, we get score from them, and we always match. So you know, previously we uh, didn't know what we were uh, talking about, but I think yeah, just like AO, um, you know, now we use AO in every patient. We do use SLICs in every patient, and because of that, you know, you get better and better and better, and it's just practice. We have a question here and, from from one participant as well. Uh, I think I think you have answered that, but I think it's it's important to stress it. Uh, the the question is the uh, uh, spine injuries with bad neurological conditions. What is the prognosis of recovery of neurology? And they say, do you say early surgery does improve the outcome, or is or it helps just to stabilize? I think we have talked about a lot, but we, I'm just going to yeah. briefly go into it. So what you need to do is you do everything possible for complete injury as well. And because if you do that properly, patient comes to, to you early. If, if everything happens, uh, fortunately for patient, they come in early, have early surgery, early traction, early surgery, straight away is hypertense, straight away is taken care of, proper nursing, hydration, make sure that pressure, the, the pressure does not drop. So we take care of the mean arterial pressure. And so multiple things that we look at at the same time, um, uh, once we have done that, and if the, page, the pressure is dropping, dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, whatever, uh, depending on the age and comorbids associated with it. So if you use all that, and then, as I said, one in five patients are going to walk again, full stop. So this yeah. is a, a breaking news. This is big news, but it's been there for 10 years but we are not looking at it. So a patient with spinal cord injury comes into, for example, a government or public hospital there, is put on a bed, told, sorry, you know, nothing can be done for you, a physiotherapy, go home. And they have got fractured yeah. dislocation, whatever, they die of pneumonia or something. Yes, if you do that in somebody with basic score four, uh, with, with a large contusion, as we talked about more than three level contusion, the chances of them making through with pneumonia and all that is small. But if you don't do yeah. anything, they have no chance. They have zero chance. So I think yeah. the message is, for, uh, especially for third world countries, where this is huge. And these are young people. And you can you know, give them hope in one in five. And future is there. I think um, all this that I'm talking about, chips and spinal cord stimulation, will be with us on a very reasonable price in next four or five years. Because all these prices are going to come down. Because the stuff used in it is not expensive at all. It is cheap. And so at the moment, obviously, it's, it's only available to few because there are trials, but I think it's going to come. So as yeah. I would suggest let's be very aggressive with every spinal cord injury patients that we get. Yeah, I agree with you. I think this is a very, a very strong and important message. And the other thing that is it's really proven in the literature is that surgery is safe on these patients. Yeah. So you don't do any harm doing that. That was something that you used to say like 10, 20 years ago. 
is like, well, it's better to wait until uh, until the patient gets some stabilization, some uh, some uh, stabilization or improvement, and it's it, it's not the case. And we know nowadays that it's safe to operate on this patient in even in the early phases. Okay, so right. in the I think thank we you. have thank we have you. come to an end, right, Doctor Raja? Thank you, right. Norman. It's been a pleasure. Yes, as always. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We shall go on to the second session. Before that, may I kindly inquire if the first chair and speaker, Professor Sharif and Professor Pereira, would be staying back for the second lecture? Yeah, yeah, I'll say that. I just have to give yeah. a, a talk in so 20 minutes. So thank you very so much. I'll, I'll leave in 20 minutes. Too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Raja. Thank you, Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. It was a great thank you, session. Thank you, We learned a lot. As thank always, very pleasure. Much. We'll Thank move you. on to the second uh, chair, Professor Yusuke Nishimura. Professor Nishimura, please take over. Yes, Professor Nishimura. Oh, you okay, may okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, hello everyone. I'm a very honored to chair this great session, and uh, pleased to have a uh, Professor Kwon Yin Chang as a speaker, uh, who is giving a lecture on an M block spondylectomy for spinal tumor. So Embrox spondylectomy is a very challenging surgical procedure and the oral spine surgeon cannot be familiar with this difficult to, uh, this procedure through a spine surgeon's career. So I have been looking forward to your lecture. Professor Chan, please start your lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nishimura's introduction. Uh, I'm Dr. Fong Yi Zhuang from National Taiwan University. It's my great honor to be here talking about total Embrox spondylectomy. This is my disclosure. First of all, I want to thank my, my mentors, Dr. Stefano Boriani, who is my instructor of the, my fellowship in Rizzoli Institute, Italy, and uh, two, two professors from my university. First one is Professor Yong Kwang Tu, previous president of WFNAs, and Professor Han Mingzhen, previous president of Asia Society of Neuro-Oncology. So today, you what need to know is the first diagnosis. You must know what you are treating. And we're going, I'm going to talk about the indications of unblocked resection of the bone tumor in the spine and the, how, how do we plan the surgery. We started with a case first. This is 47-year-old male. He complained of upper back soreness at, at the uh, post-operative day two after his total thyroidectomy for popular, papillary carcinoma. The surgical staging of the papillary carcinoma is T1N0 M0. However, the, the MRI at the second day of thyroidectomy showing that this is a hyperintensive T2 weighted lesion at T7. And uh, we, see, we find this is a, it's a bone lesion. So, so the thyroid surgeon consults radiation oncologists for radiation therapy, also consults us to evaluation. So we, we, we just told them to stop. We want to do the biopsy first. And you can see this is a total bone lesion inside the bone with a compartment, and uh, we have bone marrow replacement signal. We do the biopsy first, and the pathology is showing that it's positive for CK, S100, and brachyurea, and the negative for thyroglobin. It seems, of course, it's not a thyroid cancer. It is codoma. So it is a codoma is a very good indication for the unborn resection. So of course we do this is a T7 unborn resection and do, do the reconstruction and post, uh, and the pathology show that the margin is, is not involved by the tumor. So there is no adjuvant radiation therapy is in, needed. Now during the follow-up or after five years, these patients still have no evidence of disease. This is the typical appearance of a sacrocodoma, hyper intense and bone, with a bone ex expand cell region and with an, and then the bone marrow replacement signal at a T1 weight image. But what I'm talking about another case is a 61 year old male. He had a slow and large botac mass at, noted at, the, at last three years. He visited several neurosurgeons and they told him this is a meningal seal. But he came to me because the margin is getting larger and larger. We can see there's a hyper intense lesion, most in soft tissue part arising from the coccyx. And, and if you do not meticulously evaluate uh, see to observe on the MRI, you cannot see any bone marrow replacement 
only you can see at the T1 wedding image at the end of cortex, we have the idea this lesion might arise from the bone. We do the biopsy twice, actually, there's no typical cell find it, but we think it's still the malignant tumor, we do it, decide to do the unblocked resection. Luckily, the pathology is wide margin and pathology turns out is another codoma. After three and a half year follow-up, there's no recurrence. So today, the first thing I want to tell, tell is think not as a spine surgeon, but as an oncologist first. So the surgical planning of unborn resection is based on the clinical finding, histology, and biological behavior of tumor. The biopsy is mandatory for diagnosis before you went to the you go to the surgery. The pathologist must be informed of clinical and radiological remarks, and the biopsy should be take care. You do not contaminate the extra component space. CD guide choke up biopsies can minimize the the risk of a contamination. So the Enarching classification of bone tumor at the limbs was applied on the spine as well. Stage one, two, three for the benign bone tumor, and stage one A, one B, two A, two B for the malignant bone tumor on the at the spine. I'm going to tell it more detailed. So when you decide uh, you decide uh, you when you know the biological behavior, the histology, then you choose the right appropriate treatment. Do you choose the surgical margin you want? If you can achieve the surgical margin you plan, we, we call this surgery is anakin appropriate. If you violate the surgical margin you plan, or we also we call this surgery is anakin appropriate, which might uh, uh, cause the prognosis worse or higher recurrence rate. There are several types of surgery can be do uh, can, can be a plan for the this kind of lesion. First, we call it palliation surgery. We just decompression the spinal cord. You can re improve or restore the neurological function, but actually, this kind of surgery is without any oncological purpose. The second is intralegional excision. You can do the curettage with the gross residual tumor, or you can do the gross total extracapsule removal some with the microscopic residual tumor. Of course, the, the recurrence rate of this kind of procedure is higher than the unblock resection. The, the, goal of, the goal of unblock resection of tumor is we have, there is no residual tumor, and the prognosis no of the margin should be emphasized. There's a lot of surgical options for the spinal metastasis from the parietion, decompression, or tumor curettage. And um, you can do as aggressive or as, as radical as the total vertebrectomy in piecemeal fashion or in unblocked fashion with wide margin. So in stage one, two, three, benign bone tumor in each stage have different kind of uh, surgical planning. You can do the observation and stabilization for the stage one. And if we, the tumor is a benign bone tumor, but with the aggressive behavior, unblocked resection might be your choice of surgery. If you do go intralegional during the surgery, you have to uh, arrange the, the adjuvant radiation therapy after your surgery, uh, uh, radiation therapy after the surgery. And in Anakin stage, 1A and 1B is a good good indication for the MBAR resection. The typical pathology is codoma and control sarcoma. And intralegional excision is not satisfactory. And stage 2A, 2B is more malignant bone tumor on the spine. You, usually, neoadjuvant chemotherapy or radiation surgery is necessary to downsize the tumor and then make you can perform the MBAR resection with my, wide margin. So in the stage one, sometimes the, the tumor with the, is latent with the growth, we can absorb the capsule at, on the CT and MI. Observation or stabilization for the pathological fracture is indicated for this kind of tumor. This is, is a 61 year old female. He, she came to me for the spondylar diseases, but we find it's a T12 lesion, at, a T12 bone lesion. And we can see the MI, this lesion is well defined with the capture, capture and the, although there's uptake on the bone scan, we do the biopsy as well. The, uh, this, this turns out as asymptomatic, the T12 fibrosis dysplasia. So we keep observation on this patient. At stage two, sometimes you need the intralegional excision for, the, for the, this kind of tumor. The tumor can, can grow, but it grows slowly. And we, you can see the pseudo capture outside the tumor. The most common pathology is this osteo, osteoid osteoma or osteoblastoma. Uh, my, my mentor of the 
the inbox reception, Dr. Boriani, he had a good series of around uh, more than 50 cases of to do this uh, kind of a surgery. Sometimes he, he also performed the inbox reception of this kind of benign tumor. Regarding the stage three benign bone tumor, it means the tumor is growing is with more aggressive behavior. The growth is beneath the the pre uh, the composite mar margin with the paraspinal extension. So there we can we can observe the pseudo capsule and paraspinal part. This is a good case indication for uh, for unblocked resection. The most common type of this kind of the uh, the, the pathology is a trans cell tumor. This is a 32 year old female. She presented with back pain and with T12, trans cell tumor was noted. Of course, biopsy is confirmed the diagnosis. The first surgeon do the intralegional debulking for this patient. And of course, you can see that reconstruction is undersized. Three, uh, six months later, we can see the tumor recurrent and the tumor grows into the upper and the lower adjacent level. And this is a, a great, is a great three benign bone tumor. So come to, he come to, she come to us with this, uh, we play a three level M block resection. And of course it, in this kind of species, which is wide margin. So after four year follow up, we can see there's no evidence of disease so far. Regarding the malignant bone tumor stage 1A and 1B, 1B, uh, the pathology is usually the chondral sarcoma and chordoma. And block resection is the, the treatment of a choice. The, 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 the tumor grows, grows fast and with the pseudo capsule, sometimes 1B means the tumor grows just out be, beneath the compound margin into the paraspinal tissue. This is a 60-year-old male sacral tumor finding incidentally in a digital rectal examination. This is a typical appearance of the, the chordoma. So we do, we do the biopsy first to confirm the chordoma, the pathology diagnosis of chordoma. Then we do the unbarred section of subtotal sacrectomy with the preservation of bilateral C as to root. You can see we, we, we have to resect the, the biopsy track as well along the, the pathology. And there's no evidence of disease after five years of follow-up. There are more complicated sacrorectomy cases uh, regarding a very complicated spinal pelvic reconstruction. We have to reconstruction a bilateral SI joint and reconstruction a L5-S1 joint. But, but the reconstruction is another issue. I, I, I do not want to talk about this today, but we're going to show this the image here. So this is 21-year-old male. He's, he's a police officer. He presented with a spasticity gait. And it, at the, the, this is a T4 bone lesion. You can see the bone the cortex around the, this uh, bone tumor and the compressed the spinal cord from the right side. Because this tumor is, is surrounded the, the spinal cord more than 180 degree, you cannot perform the one piece and block resection as well. So you have to plan, you have to go Intra, intentional intralegional at some part of this tumor, then you try to remove whole the tumor. The pathology shows it's a grade two control sarcoma. So like this, we remove this tumor in two parts. And at the pedicle part, we go to in, intralegional intentionally. And of course, we, we violate the margin. Although we remove the tumor totally, we still apply the adjuvant radiation therapy on this patient. So far, two and a half years follow up, there is no recurrence. Regarding the malignant tumor, of, of stage 2A and 2B is more malignant, like the glioblastoma. You, you, the, there are a lot of skip mass or skip lesion outside the, the main mass lesion, and this grows very fast. So, so usually preoperative, I mean, new adjuvant chemotherapy or radiation therapy is necessary to downsize the tumor to make the tumor resectable. So this is a case presented with L2 pathological fracture. And previous surgeon do not recognize this is a pathological fracture. He do the posterior fixation and decompression on this patient. And, and uh, luckily he did a biopsy, but find out this is an osteosarcoma. When the patient referred to me, you can see the tumor mass lesion growing like this. It's surrounding whole spinal cord with invasion to bar, bar, bilateral psoas muscle and paraspinal muscle. And 
uh, uh, unluckily, this patient is, unfortunately, this patient dies during the newer adjuvant CCRT. The treatment of osteosarcoma, the most effective surgical intervention is wide envelope resection. However, newer adjuvant therapy is necessary to, to downsize the tumor. Uh, the, the, they have higher response response and higher survival rate if you do a new adjuvant therapy. And radiation therapy for the osteosarcoma is pro, uh, comes with a poor response. And new adjuvant radiation therapy, downsizing the tumor, then make, you, uh, the, make the tumor resectable. So according to the ASMO guideline 2018, if you still are suspecting the primary bone tumor on the x-ray, you have to do a serious image evaluation. Then you have to do the biopsy, confirm the histological and molecular assessment. That you have a grading, then you try to go for the further surgical planning. Regarding the bone sarcoma, in the, the, about the osteosarcoma and urine sarcoma, they are more malignant and more aggressive tumor. Usually neoadjuvant chemotherapy or neoadjuvant radiation therapy is necessary to downsize the tumor, then make the tum tumor resectable. So back to our main topic, what is block recession? Well, this means the whole tumor recession encased by a continuous shear of healthy tissue. This thickness of the shear is called a margin. The margin is relative to the patient's prognosis and survival. This concept is first proposed by Professor Stenow from, from Sweden. He's a general surgeon, but he, do, he, he did a lot of anato neuroanatomical study, but he, he's the first one apply the, how the surgery of, the, of gastrointestinal cancer to the spine tumor. So he's, he, and later on, we all know the famous to Professor Tomita from Kanazawa University, uh, Japan. He is the first guy to generalize and standardize the, the total M block spondylectomy at thoracic spine. Sing, we mean it's a single posterior approach to, to do the thoracic, thoracic total M block spondylectomy. And, and uh, I just uh, attend his, lec his lecture this year. Uh, this year in, in Asia Pacific Spine Society. He's talking, talking about his thought and his idea, how, how did he started to establish hold uh, this procedure of total impact spondylectomy. We call it test surgery now. Uh, following Professor T Tomita's legacy, Professor Kawahara and Professor Murakami, they are also good instructors instructor and good friend of, with, with, uh, of, of, of mine. And uh, they, they gave me a lot of good advice and a suggestion during I established this procedure in, in our university. And of course, Professor Stefano, Stefano Boriani, uh, he's the first one to propose to divide it, the whole spinal column from the sector one to sector 12. Then you divide it the layers, paraspinal soft tissue layer A, the superficial bone tissue B, deep bone tissue C, epidural space D, and intradural E from layer A and layer E, sector one to sector 12. This is for, uh, for us to how to plan the amplifier resection. This, this planning, planning system or staging system, you can make, make you can plan the surgery, not only in the thoracic spine, but also from the cervical spine and down to L5. So at first, if the tumor involved from the sector, th sector three and to sector, sector 10, you can do the one piece posterior element removal in, in m -block flexion. If the, the tumor involved from sector four to sector eight or sector five to sector nine with only one pedicle involvement, it's a good indication to do the, to do the test surgery proposed by the to, uh, Professor Tomita, if the tumor involved only one side pedicle from 10 to eight or sector three to sector five, it's good case to do the hemivertebrectomy, also called sagittal resection to, to, to achieve the M block resection of the bone tumor. Further, they classif classify the, the M block resection in, in seven types. The, the first type is the type one WBB embryo resection is the tumor located many at the anterior colon of the 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 uh, spine, spine, uh, the, the vertebra, and the tumor must not involve the layer C, the deep 
you know, the deep bone tissue, and you can do a single post anterior approach to release the tumor from the anterior to remove the tumor from the from uh, from the anterior single anterior approach. I'm going to show you a case. This is a 64 year old male. He presented with left C5 palsy, and he had a history that five years ago he had a hypothyroid cancer. And he received a high dose radiation therapy. To, to and the, the uh, this is a, the dosimetry of previous radiation therapy. And hypopharyngeal cancer ha has been cured, but now they, they have tumor mass growing at the the border area of the previous dosimetry. And because the his soft tissue at the anterior neck is, has been irradiated, so it's very stiff and fibrotic. The 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 first surgeon. They decide to do a posterior approach to do a laminoplasty, try to decompress the core and take the biopsy. It, it turned out it's a chondral sarcoma. But when the patient referred to me, you can see the, the, the tumor ha, has been, because the border has been violated, the tumor just contaminated and grows beneath the previous compound margin and grows everywhere surrounding, surrounding the spinal cord. So when this kind of patient referred to me, we have nothing to, we cannot do anything for, for him. And type two WBB embryo resection means single posterior approach for the embryo resection. The two A means the, the tumor located at the posterior element only, and you can do the bilateral pediculotomy and remove whole the whole the posterior element in one piece. And two C means you have to, to do the posterior release and lateral release of the tumor part and do the laminectomy and pediculotomy at the, the healthy side and tr transect the vertebral body as a sagittal resection, then re remove whole the tumor from the posterior, from the posterior approach is a 2C. And 2B is the standardized test surgery is the most common type which proposed by the Professor Tomita. You can, re if the tumor involve at anterior and middle colon and one pedicle only, you can do the, the posterior decompression and posterior release in piecemeal or one piece patient, both of it's okay. And use your finger to, blunt, to, to bluntly dissect it the, and the vertebral body away from the gray vessel, and then to do, do the upper and the lower dissectomy or, or osteotomy, then you can remove all the spine, uh, the vertebral body out from, the, from your single posterior approach. I'm going to show you, show, show the, the case. This is a 62 year female. A, she, uh, she had a history of leiomyosarcoma with solitary metastasis. And this is first lesion identified. And after three months of, of target therapy and immunotherapy, your tumor seems, seems, to, uh, seems to, to progress. So it's a good case for, for the unblock section and do the reconstruction. The margin is free. This is another 57-year-old female. She had a cholangial carcinoma with oligometastasis. You can see that uh, at the L, 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 L1, L, L1 metastasis tumor, and you can do a single posterior approach to do the the unblock resection. The, the PET scan shows only one, uh, no, no other metastasis. Oh, the, the, the picture of the, the specimen looks like this, the margin is wide, wide margin and reconstruction like this. And because at Sorak's Sorakolaba junction, we do the, the double row reconstruction. We all know that Tomita survival score well and the, the Tokuhashi survival score. Those, those score is uh, the prognosis prediction system for the spine metastasis patient. If a patient survival longer and with the oligometastasis at spine, it's a good case to do the incisional surgery. This is a protocol of a from the Rizzoli, uh, proposed by Rizzoli Institute. In some cases, we, you, you also need to do the unblock resection to make the patient have better prognosis. So from our institute, we find that there are good Good indication in the spine metastasis. First one is a solitary breast cancer and solitary thyroid cancer because they have a longer survival and better systemic control. And regarding two hypervascular tumor, renal cell carcinoma and hepatocellular carcinoma, they, they, they are very good indication to do the unbar resection because they are very hypervascular. During the preoperative angiography, you can observe very high flow arterial venous shunting inside the tumor, just like the AVM surgery. You do the AVM, AVM, 
arterial venous malformations in the brain, you, you, you recycle this kind of AVN in the brain, you have to dissect the AVN away from the surrounding brain tissue. You cannot go inside the AVN, we cause massive bleeding. I'm going to show you a case. This is a 65-year-old uh, uh, male. He, he had a history of liver cancer. He presented to our emergency room with, of, with acute power plagia in, in two to three days. And there's a, a pathological fracture at the T, T4 with spinal cord compression. And this is a lesion. And usually we, we will do the preoperative vascular evaluation, we found out that the vascularity of this, this vertebra just similar to the aorta. So we just canceled the emergency surgery. We, set, we sent the patient to, a, to the angel, angel room. You can see the, the vascularity of the, this tumor just similar to the aorta. We found out there's a huge pseudo aneurysm inside the vertebra. So this is a good case to do the embryocrization. You can control the vessel from the anterior, then remove a whole vertebra. If you, you do the intralegional incision, debarking or separation surgery to this condition, you have you may encounter massive bleeding on the operation table. So we are going to talk about type three WBB embryo resection. It means usually we do the anterior approach first to do a release, then the second posterior approach to do the posterior release release of the tumor from the dura and remove the tumor from the posterior approach. Usually we talk about the, the cervical, cervical the tumor at the cervical spine with one side neural foramen or, or one side transverse foramen involvement. You have to control one vertebral artery and do the anterior a re an anterior osteotomy, then you turn the patient from the back to remove whole tumor from the posterior posterior approach. And Regarding the uh, thoracic lumbar area, sometimes the tumor located at one size, you can do this kind of approach. Or the tumor at the, the main, main, part, main part, the tumor grows anteriorly a lot. Or in my institute, the most condition I do a type 3 WWM block is this, this patient came to me be due to previous anarchy inadequate in appropriate surgery and the tumor had recurrence and the tumor has been radiate, irradiated. So I have a, to do the anterior approach to release the great vessel or esophagus from the vertebral artery, uh, from the verte vertebral body. Then we do the posterior approach to remove all the tumor from the posterior, from the posterior approach. I'm going to show you, show you a case. This is 49 year old male. He presented bilateral anterior thigh pain for six months and the, the, the but left hip flexion weakness is about four. You can see this large hy hyper-intense lesion on T2 weighted image with bilateral psoas muscle extension. Of course, in this lesion, you cannot, you, you have to go intralegional during the, your embolization. It's inten intentional intralegional. So we do the anterior approach first to release the, the, the the vertebra from the great vessel and transect the psoas muscle head for your margin. And, and then you do a posterior approach to remove the whole tumor. It's a, the muscle head you transect. The other psoas muscle head is like, like this. So do, we do the, can, do, can do the W type, BB type three and bar resection. Uh, after this surgery, uh, adjuvant ser radiation therapy is necessary. And luckily this is no evidence of disease for about two and a half years. This is a 59-year-old male with the back pain. And he presented with the left T9 paraspinal mass. And the first surgery is done by a thoracic surgeon. They do the, a small thoracotomy to remove this tumor. And with, you can see they also dissecting the aorta after the tumor removal of aorta back to the normal position. But it's a typical wrong operation on the wrong patient by the wrong surgeon. It's a, typic, it's a, a very typical triple W scenario. This tumor, the, the, the tumor of course, is contaminated everywhere with, with recurrence, with invasion of by, with the paraspinal muscle and the aorta. And they also applied high dose radiation to this area. The aorta is, is, is adhered to the vertebral body. And they, they was referred to another spine surgeon. They do the decompression surgery and do the fixation when the tumor recurs against 
about three months later, they do another decompression, the tumor keep growing anteriorly and intracanally. So how do you plan the surgery? So this is a, we would do the anterior approach to release the aorta and the esophagus esophagus uh, away from the, the mass lesion, and then we do the posterior approach. We also identify the thorac, the, the adenoid key which is arising from the, the it is left T11 lesion. We have to transect this, this red, uh, segmental artery. So this is, on the left side, it is a, this is a cost, uh, thoracic cage, this, uh, and uh, this is a, uh, the caudal area, this is the abdomen, this is the back. We, this is oblique inc incision. And and this this, this uh, I think it is a diaphragm. It's a diaphragm. We we consult cardiovascular surgeon to dissect the aorta away from the from the vertebral first, and we just cover whole the aorta with the cortex membrane to pro, to to better identification from the posterior approach. Then we, we do the posterior approach. You can see the the. You, you can see the protected aorta here is pulsation and do the posterior release. You can remove all the tumor from the, from the posterior approach. And this is a, the picture of the specimen. This is a, a type three WBB unblocked recession. And we are going to, and this is a reconstruction with the, the expandable cage and, and the allograft and with the posterior fixation. Uh, we are going to, going to talk about type 4 WBB unblocked resection. This, this is for cervical spine. You have to do the posterior release first, and then you do the osteotomy from the healthy side, and then you have to do another an, an anterior approach from the, from the affected side. You have control the great vessel, and you have to sacrifice the, the, the root here to remove all the tumor from the, the third anterior approach. This is a 44 year old male. He had, uh, she had neck, neck pain for months. Just after her surgery of lung adenocarcinoma, but the, the, the her lung adenocarcinoma stage in this T1 and zero, but we find is there is a the neck mass. This is a C5 with, with, with extension to the, Spinal canal and the with involvement of bilateral bilateral neural foramen and the transver transverse foramen. How oh, this is carotid artery here. We can we can see the 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 margin of the tumor the border of the tumor, and during the angiography we find that the one vertebral artery is already occluded and another vertebral artery is severe stenosis stenosis. And all the posterior circulation is supplied by, by bilateral P cone. So we decide to transect, transect bilateral vertebral artery and remove the tumor totally. Of course, they, we, we have to go intralegionally at the right neural foramen, because, uh, bilateral neural foramen, because after, uh, before the surgery, we discussed with the patient, she decided to preserve bilateral a cervical root is high function, so we have to go in, go inside the tumor at the bilateral cervical area. But this the intentional intralegional removal. Regarding type five WBB unblocked resection, it means we usually would do the posterior release first, and we do the combined anterior po to posterior approach to remove whole tumor from the from the anterior from the, from the anterior approach. This kind of tumor usually is uh, used for the, the tumor located at the lumbar area, at the lumbar area. So this is a 32 year old male. He complained of mechanical back pain with radiation to, to thigh. We find out this is a pathological fracture at L3. And, and we, uh, the image is showing this is giant cell tumor and by, by uh, biopsy confirmed diagnosis. And uh, you can see the the tumor is hypervascular, and after uh, embolization, we, we control the we can control the vascular okay, down, uh, downgrade the vascularity of the tumor mass. Then we went to the surgery. We do the, the posterior approach first to remove the posterior element of M blocked, and to remove the anterior component from it from, to hold the tumor from the anterior approach and do the fixation. And the type six WBB embolization is. Is is uh, designed for the L5 unblocked session. I will talk about this later. And 
type 7 WBV embryonization is, is reserved for the large tumor located at the anterior and the middle colon. Uh, we, we, we don't have this kind of tumor in in Taiwan, this tumor has to be very large, and in Taiwan, the medical accessibility is quite high. We don't have such large tumor. So we're going to talk about uh, one case about a uh, type six amblyopia resection. This is a sixty-eight year old male. He had no malignancy history. He, he presented with a pathological fracture at L five. Pre pre uh, previous surgeon do a posterior fixation and do a decompression of L5 and do a biopsy, the pathology shows giant cell tumor. So the tumor, after the surgery, the tumor progressed in three months. So the patients referred to me. And we do the embolization first. This is a preoperative X-ray. And this is a residual giant cell tumor, energy in stage three, stage three because it grows beneath the, pre, uh, the compartment margin and inside the canal. So we, we, we know that the margin, we need a wide margin. And uh, we have we have to understand the anat anatomical constraint because it's an L5. It's deep. It's seated deep between iliac wings, and it's close and countered by common iliac vessel. And the high function role of the L5 root cannot be sacrificed. So uh, usually we we will arrange a CT to evaluate the bone involvement and then the, and the bone destruction. Of course, the MRI to understanding to understand medullary and extraosseous com component. Usually we will do an angiography, like sometimes we, we, can, we have to identify where the adenine kiwi is arising from, like this. And uh, for a type six WBB umbrella resection, you have to do an anterior approach to dissect the, the vertebral body away from the normal tissue from the healthy side first, then turn the patient from the back to, to do the posterior release. Then you do the another anterior approach to remove the whole tumor mass from at the other side of anterior approach. The first approach like this, posterior approach, and then another anterior approach. So this is uh, the, the the final surgical view from the right brittle peritoneal approach. This is the cranial size, caudal size, dose of ventral. This is the L5 tumor. We dissected the vena cava and right iliac vein away from the vertebral body and do the L4-5 dissectomy, L5-1 dissectomy, and remove the tum whole tumor. So you can identify right L4 and L5 root and identify the, the L4 root of the contralateral side. This is specimen pictures and the whole do, how do we reconstruction the L5? Regarding this is my final part of my talk. It's, how about Adam Kiwi's artery? This is a 48 year old male. He, he presented with back pain with radiation to left lower abdomen. He, he presented with the first, this is a tumor arising from the left T9, coxal transverse, uh, uh, transverse junction. And previous surgeon to do the surgery to remove the rib head of this part, and so and the passage turned out is control sarcoma. But you can see obviously previous surgeon do not achieve wide margin. You can see the they are still have bone bone chips remaining here. So the the patient went went to our university for better pain control of the radiculopathy, and we find out that tumor is progressed. Previous tumor located at left T9, now T7, T8, and T9, we have uptake on the PET scan. And on the MRI, we can identify tumor recurrence at three level. It's T7 at left side, T8 at the medial part, with the pre maybe com contaminated by previous implant and have recurrence at the previous surgical site. And unfortunately, we find the adenine queries around, arising from the right, right T9, uh, radi uh, radicular artery. The tumor is hypovascular, so we did we we playing a three level embryo recession, and this is a preoperative condition. And right after the surgery, the the patient has good neurological status. But about six hours after the surgery, the patient develop a newly onset paraplegia in the intensive care unit. We give the component therapy, we give to try the made out of sore medial, we elevate the MAP. And luckily the patient has partial recovery at post-operative day three, and the patient turns back to the general world. 
I'm very lucky because the patient re recovered well. He, 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 he was discharged smoothly at the post-operative post day 20. This, the final passage showed, showed is a chondroblastic osteosarcoma. It's quite, it's a very malignant. So luckily this patient has no evidence of disease uh, about four years later. This is the follow-up image just yesterday. And we all know that Adam Kiwi is, uh, is supplied from the, the segmental artery or intercostal artery as thoracic, uh, especially at the left side of the, from T8 to L1. And the typical hairpin turn appearance on the on the, the angiography is a typical appearance of Adam Kiwis. We will usually identify that. So there are serial studies done by the Tomita group from Kanazawa University. First thing is that how does interrupt interruption of bilateral segmental artery affect the the vertebral body blood flow. They find that if they like get three level of segmental artery, the vertebral body blood flow can reduce to around 20 to 30%. If you, if you do the preoperative embolization, this is evidence to help you to reduce blood loss without the spinal cord function change. And they, they propose another question that, how, how, uh, how is the influence on the spinal cord blood flow and the function by interruption of bilateral segmental artery up to three level? They find out if we like get three level of segmental artery, the vertebral body blood flow will reduce to about one fourth, but the spinal cord blood flow can remain stationary above 80%. The SSCP SS, uh, and MEP of the, the, the animal, do, uh, the experimental animal is dogs. It's don't, the spinal cord function wouldn't be compromised. And how many ligations of bilateral segmental artery can cause ischemic spinal cord dysfunction? They find out if you like get the sigma, segmental artery up to five level to seven level, seven level you will affect the, the spinal cord function. If you like get five pairs of segmental artery to seven pairs of segmental artery, after six to eight hours, you can find that they have they have the the, the pro slowly progress neurological deficits. deficits. This in phenomenon just very uh, is compatible with our our case just demonstrated. The if you like get to the the segmental artery, the neurological uh, neuro neuro neurological deficit deficit. Will, would not develop immediately. They will develop about six to eight hours after the surgery. So it is safe to, to do the ligations of segmental artery up to four level if no Adam Q is involved. It's another question that if you, if the, you ligate the segmental artery with the, with the supply of uh, artery of Adam Kiwis, how many levels? of segmental artery can be ligated. So what they find it is safe to ligate three levels of segment, segmental artery, including Adam Kiwi's, Kiwi's artery supplier. So they have also the clinical series to prove this, to, to prove this uh, condition. So, so far in our hospital, we, we just, we will do the unbarred section up to three levels if the patient have Adam Kiwi's in, involvement. So up to three day, three body bra interruption of the Adam Kiwi's artery does not affect ne neurological function. So this is my last slide. This surgery cannot based on the surgeon alone. Oh, I usually rely on my my teammate. We we have to a lot of discussion between uh, medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, and re pathologist, diagnosis, and the interventional radiologist, ra radiologist. So it is special thank to the, our university spine oncology team. They helped me a lot to, to perform this surgery and establish this surgery in our university. Thank you. This is my talk. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, your, your beautiful presentation and uh, 
uh, many, a lot of uh, great cases that uh, you are doing uh, uh, aggressive surgery so nicely. So, uh, yeah, so any question uh, from the we can take a few uh, comments, of course, from Professor Pereira as well. Professor Pereira, any comments from your side? Well, this is an uh, this is really an amazing experience and um, and um, an outstanding overview of very very difficult very difficult techniques. Um, I always have a problem uh, in um, in uh, particularly in sacrocardiomas and chondrosarcomas when um, when the, well, in, in, uh, when, you, when you need um, a middle or high sacrectomy, uh, about the, this kind of balance between, uh, between uh, um, oncologically appropriate surgery versus the deficit that you are, get, that you are causing. I know it's always at the end, it's the, it's, it's the patient's decision, but the patient's decision is very variable from from cultures to cultures uh, it's a very cultural thing uh, but uh, how how do you manage this uh, with uh, when you need to sacrifice for instance s2 nerve roots and you know that the patient will get uh, will, will be incontinent and uh, how do you manage this oh i think it's it's a we call this patient-based sub subjective decision-making process. I will explain, I, of course, I will explain both sides, the both kinds of surgery. And uh, I make the patient to decide, to, to decide. And they, they, they take the, the, they have to take, because they have to live with the neurological deficit or they have to face, the, of course, the oncological recurrence in the near future. So he's the one to have to face the problem. So I have to, they usually is a big multidisciplinary meeting between me and the patient and the family members. Is we have, everyone have to sit down to discuss with that. If the patient, they accept the neurological de deficit and uh, to choose to better oncological prognosis. I will do the preoperative colostomy and uh, the, the and the cystostomy preoperative. I will perform that. Then I then then do the total M total M block sacrectomy. And some of patients did choose this kind of procedure. So they 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 understanding the outcome, they understanding the deficit, they understand understanding the difficult in their life they're going to face. So it's very important. And also we I have also have very young young patient, 24 year old female with huge sacral giant cell tumor. And it is very difficult to to tell them that she she will live with the incontinence and and the difficulty of urinary identification in her, in her whole life. But so after discussion, I, I, I just do, do the introductional debulking, uh, debulking surgery, do the fixation, try to reconstruction and uh, send the patient to, to proton or radiation therapy. So you have to discuss with this patient well. So in our society, because I, in Taiwan, I am still a young surgeon, so I have to be, be very, very careful about this kind of complication and neurological outcome. So I definitely will explain explain both sides uh, the scenario to the patient and let them to decide. It's very important. So we call this subjective patient decision decision making process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We can take one more comment or question from Dr. Liu Bun Seng. Dr. Liu? Uh, yeah, I don't have any question. Very, very nice presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Right. Thank you very much. In that case, we can wind up. Before that, we'll take the final remarks from Professor Nishimura. Uh, this is very uh, so technically demanding surgery. And I'm very, uh, I'm very pleased to see this. Uh, Beautiful presentation, and I'm so impressed uh, by the his uh, uh, Professor Chang the presentation. And uh, actually, I would like to learn uh, surgical techniques from him. And uh, I I want to do uh, take the, his uh, surgical procedure into my clinical practice. Uh, I'm so impressed. Very uh, 
Uh, okay, I appreciate, thanks. very appreciate. Thank, thank, you. thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. It was indeed a mind blowing lecture, wonderful surgical technique and philosophy behind this end block spondylectomy. I would like to wind this up officially on behalf of the education committee of the ACNS, Professor Salman Sharif and Professor Fonin Shuang, as well as the chairs, Professor Nishimura and Professor Paulo Perella for the time and support for this ACNS webinars. I would like to thank my co-host, Dr. Liu Boon Singh for today. So until we all meet on the 14th of August, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.